Welcome, everybody, and thanks for coming. Uh, folks who are on the outside and want uh, maybe grabbing something to eat, if you could uh, uh, come in, we'll try to get started. And there are, there are quite a few seats available if you're standing. Uh, I'm uh, Tom Apple, and I'm delighted to have you come here and participate in this campus conversation. And uh, as I say that, Let's try to make sure this is a, a conversation. So uh, I have a few folks who are going to talk to you about some of the issues that we have discussed since our first forum. Uh, our first forum, I thought, was very productive. And I'll tell you, I'll remind those of you who weren't here uh, for the first meeting that in response to my email, I received literally hundreds of replies, and I continue to receive them, and I want everyone, first of all, to feel they can continue to write to me at that private email, tadapple5 uh, at gmail.com. But they, most of the, the responses uh, can be summed up by the list uh, that I have shown here, which is, uh, but, and these are more or less in the order that, uh, uh, in terms of number of responses. Uh, an incredible interest from the entire campus on our facilities and physical infrastructure, whether it's the beauty of the campus or the environment in the classroom. Is the classroom uh, moldy or mildewy and so on? So uh, facilities was the biggest issue. Campus safety, uh, and particularly with many of our our female students, faculty, and staff. Sustainability, in which there's a tremendous interest of people to be part of a sustainability effort. The general feeling about service on campus, the replies you get when you have a problem. If you're a student and you come for help, uh, how well do you get a response to that? If you're faculty and you're trying to put a grant in, how well do, you, how well do you people respond? Academic rigor, um, the, uh, it turns out from a survey that we ran several years ago, uh, about half the students that leave the university and go somewhere else feel they weren't challenged enough. And finally, general campus morale. So our goal here today, uh, I'm gonna have a few folks talk to you about, uh, we're gonna focus a little bit more on the top three bullets today and then I want to have a follow-up, uh, another campus forum on the bottom three. And uh, clearly, you know, some of the ones on the bottom relate very heavily to the ones on the top, and, and, and we'll be happy to deal with that. But if you have a comment, you want to make a, some suggestions here, please feel free to speak up, because we want this to be, again, a campus conversation, uh, not a monologue. But I have a number of uh, folks who uh, from your input, we've had a lot of conversations about what can we do now, what can we do on a short term to help on some of these issues, and what can be long-term goals where we really work to make these things better on campus. So we're going to work on both short and long term, and uh, I'll start off uh, by handing over the microphone to Steve Meter. Is this good? Can you hear me? Is that right? OK, thanks. Thanks for letting me know in the back. Well, oh, which one advances? Thanks. So uh, thank you for coming. And my name is Steve Meter. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Planning for the Campus. Uh, that's the physical planning for the campus. So um, landscape master plan, transportation plan, sustainability plans, energy, and so on. And um, Chancellor Apple asked me to come by today and talk about some of the um, uh, projects and planning that's, um, that we have and how it integrates and um, uh, at this point in time, this is planning that we've never done before. And for the first time in our history, we have an understanding of what many of the issues that actually run this campus are in a, a very quantified way. So I'm going to go through a few of these and the ones in green right now, the ones in green are kind of the guiding policies uh, for the campus. 
So we have the strategic plan from 2010. There was an energy policy from 2006, and that said in 2006, based on a 2003 benchmark for the campus, that we are going to reduce um, our overall energy consumption by 30% by 2012 and 50% by, 50 by 2015 and get 25% renewables by 2020. We're uh, on a path to achieve that, although there's still a ways to go. Uh, the long-range development plan for the campus is, the, uh, is our overarching plan for our physical development for the campus. And then under that and supporting all of this are the plans that I was just referring to. So we've got a transportation demand management plan. This is quantifying how people get to campus, where they come from, how other means of uh, transportation can be uh, uh, used so we, we reduce our dependence on single occupancy vehicles. We're looking at a uh, campus landscape master plan, which I'll talk about in a few minutes in a little bit more depth. Uh, the, the, the campus water and sewer and drainage master plan. This is a large plan that connects all of these issues uh, uh, that underlie us, including water conservation. Looking at the, uh, the space planning and management, for the first time in our campus history, we have an understanding of who's in which spaces, how much space we have, how those spaces are being operated. Uh, we, and the, the team I'll show you in a few minutes has, has surveyed and has drawings, two and three dimensional drawing build out for 3.5 million square feet of our nearly 6 million square feet of occupied spaces on the campus. We have um, a signage plan, a, a, a heritage plan for the campus, a building design and performance standard, which will include a, a color guideline. This is a developing a metric for how our buildings will operate and, um, and perform. So energy uh, quotas for all the lighting, HVAC, and so on. Uh, we have uh, now master planning happening currently at the campus uh, on the College of Ed side of the campus, as well as the lower campus master planning is, uh, uh, is beginning, coming up in the next few months. So I'll talk about this um, <coughs> landscape master plan. Now, one thing I, I want to say, and I know many of you will probably disagree with me, and many of you will probably um, be surprised to hear this, but sometimes it takes a long time to get something done on, around here. <laughs> what? No, I, I know you don't believe it, but it's true. I mean, sometimes. But, <laughs> But, so these are, these are plans that actually have an impact for the, ne the next 30 years. But what we're here to talk about is um, how the, the chancellor is, has been um, putting the call out and listening uh, to what, what the uh, concerns and interests are from the campus community. And from these longer plans, we're able to pull pieces out to activate immediately. So within the landscape master plan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on three, um, three projects that can roll out pretty quickly. So we're looking right now, if we just look at um, these civic scale, these are civic scale projects, right? So if we look here, we've got from Varney Circle down to University Avenue. Now this is, um, this is one of our main gateways, one of our main gateways to the campus, and this is what it currently looks like. And when we look at it a little closer, this entranceway is a do not enter entranceway. Okay, so we know we've got to do better. We know that these things, this is not the face to the community that we want to have. So we're actually now, out of the landscape master plan, able to implement, uh, able to implement a plan to, uh, to work on, on this project. So this is what it looks like looking back at University Avenue. Okay, so looking from in between Gartley and Sinclair and looking, looking uh, out at uh, University. This, now, what I'm going to show you are a couple of concepts on what can be done. These have to be detailed out. And, and, the, and the landscape master plan is up on the planning office website, and you can all take a look at it and make comments. So this is what it looks like now, but this is what it could look like. So a gateway, uh, a, a sense of entry. And, a, and so uh, I'll be showing you some of the landscape lighting and furniture that we plan to put in. That would be landscape throughout here. So there are places for people to gather. We build social spaces into our interstitial spaces and into our landscape. Another, another one would be Legacy Mall. Looking from Dole Street by the Law School parking uh, portal and then up to um, Varney Circle and going around Miller. So this is uh, an, uh, a view of looking towards Dole of what it looks like right now. Okay? This is what it could look like. Again, we can put the furniture out so people don't have to sit on the ground if they don't want to. But um, this is, again, these kind of immediate build-outs that uh, we can get going on right away. Uh, another one is Varney Circle. 
So Varney Circle is one of our kind of historic focal points on the campus. And looking, looking at this, so here's a, um, a, a view with some notations on it, a plan view. And here's what it looks like right now. Now this is a concept of what it could look like. So we build it out and it becomes, look at the connection here to Hawaii Hall from Varney Circle that doesn't exist now. This kind of connection that goes with the, uh, the axial relationship all the way up that main, that beautiful area of McCarthy Mall that's going to, that can also be improved from there to there. More pedestrian friendly. The idea that it was about people, not about cars, is really a major concern here. So also looking at this and saying, none of these plans, we talk about sustainability, what does that mean? But none of these are, are devoid of, uh, of these level of considerations and really getting the metrics into the warm and fuzzy feeling of sustainability. So looking at how the, the topography, what we build out, even the buildings and what water comes to them, what building as far as rainwater, the, build, the water that we're using, how that can be, how that can be captured, used, used wisely, captured, reused, and recharging the aquifers. So these are uh, opportunities to do that. Now the reason I'm talking about the interconnection of these plans because as we have a landscape master plan, we also have this water and drainage plan. These things can now tie together. Bringing these things together uh, at this point in our history gives us the opportunity to link building design, building water catchment, uh, catchment uh, from topographies and landscape, and also building that out in the infrastructure. This all matters and it's an interconnectivity that has opportunities in it. So looking at some of the receptacles, the new receptacles that could be around the campus, some of the new furniture here, and it's a matter of trust. People are not going to walk away with the chairs. We don't have to bolt everything down. It's a, it's a place to make social gatherings and people comfortable. The new lighting, so it's not only going to improve security, but it's also going to reduce energy and improve the level of, of, of light that we have around the campus. So these are LEDs. And these are the, uh, we've got a hierarchy of lighting, whether it's roadway or walkways, that, uh, that come about here. I want to talk quickly about the, um, the space planning. And this goes into the GIS mapping. And this is a group of students that work on this. None of these projects happen uh, alone. They're connected with uh, many uh, uh, faculty and um, students from around the campus. So these students represent about eight different departments as they're doing the 2D and 3D drawings to, uh, for all of our buildings and also working with uh, GIS to put the buildings into a larger layer so we understand the systems here. So working with Chief Ogino, Ogino on this here so we understand and get, uh, get this into GIS levels and layers and know how this is going to work to improve security on the campus. This mapping system is also helping us to bring emergency services more effectively to the campus. So as we look at bringing, working with the city and county to deliver the emergency services more effectively, we're also improving the effectiveness of security on the campus. And here's how the, the maps work. We've got We've got, uh, this is a landscape plan, so we can identify every tree, whether it's historic or not, or fruit bearing. Looking at now uh, uh, the transportation management plan that we've been, uh, the planning office and auxiliary services and transportation division there have been working together on, but looking at now the count on all the ADA, permit parking, daily parking, and so on, and being able to count that. Here's our infrastructure, part, a start on the infrastructure that we don't see for the water. So understanding what's under the ground and how it can affect our performance above the ground to avoid flooding but improve uh, setting up new models for sustainability, best management practices. And then looking at these two and three D build outs and we've got this in this layer but then putting the information from the maps, from the drawings together with the information about the rooms. Does it have instructional equipment in it? Is it, is it uh, ready to get redone, uh, revitalized? Is, are these the walls that will be painted? And getting more of that information together. So working, Christina is going to talk about this uh, in a minute. So the idea that all of these layers come together as we improve classrooms and improve security, reduce our energy, reduce our water, and set uh, really new standards for best management practices and solutions on the campus that can be transferable to the rest of the state uh, as we approach some of these issues of the 21st century that are, that are looming and large. So now uh, that's a very quick overview. I know I'm talking and giving you information from a fire hose here, um, but there's a lot more to discuss, but I'm going to ask Christina to come up and talk about the classroom renovations. Got it. Okay. 
Aloha, everyone. Aloha. How are you? <laughs> I'm Christina Ani. I'm the Interim Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. I'm really happy to be here today to talk about a particular, very fun and exciting project that we've been uh, really involved in for some months now. It's a classroom, classroom uh, makeover project. Um, as many of you who teach and study here at the university uh, can attest, many of our general purpose classrooms are less than ideal in terms of teaching and learning. Uh, as you can see, there's some uh, ceiling tile issues, furniture, flooring that's stained and, and less than ideal. And what we're trying to do is actually improve the, the, the physical environment so that we really have more ideal spaces for teaching and learning. Uh, with the Outreach College's financial support and Reed Dossenbrock, the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, uh, spearheading this initiative, what we've done is try to pull together a team of individuals to identify spaces that are most ideal for making a fairly efficient and quick classroom makeover project. Um, what that meant was we were um, selecting general purpose classrooms that are highly utilized across campus and would be um, able to be renovated quickly and efficiently in order to make a really visible difference in teaching and learning. Um, as you can see, we've selected 24 uh, classrooms in nine buildings to do this project. Uh, again, this is, uh, instruction involves campus-wide classes. Um, we have two classrooms selected for renovation during the winter break uh, in Watanabe, 113 and 114 probably one to two in the spring semester, or spring break, and then the remaining 20 classrooms will be renovated for summer 2013. And the purpose of this timeline is to minimize disruption to classroom uh, teaching. Uh, we can't take many classes offline because we have a lot of uh, teaching going on during the regular semesters, so that's the plan. Um, with input from the Office of Planning, from um, Office of Faculty Development and Academic Support, in particular Center for Teaching Excellence and Center for Instructional Support, we've had a whole SWAT team of individuals to help uh, give us input in terms of what, what we really need, what would make a physical, a physical difference that would really improve the classroom feel. In particular, we have more mobility, more agility, as Kathy Kane talks about. Specifically, we have tables and chairs that will be more mobile, and we have a 20, if any of you uh, have sit, seat in uh, the classroom uh, tablet armchairs that are more 19th century, they're less than ideal, less than comfortable, and often mismatched and some are broken. Well, we've, we've test drove many of them. We had vendors sending uh, sample chairs to uh, Kathy's shop right down the hall here in 106. And we test drove a number of different um, furniture options and have zeroed in on a couple of options that seem to be ideal. Um, flooring wall, including color, uh, has been selected. Um, again, new, new, typically these types of twosy um, chair or tables with chairs might be more appropriate for certain types of classrooms, and new and approved tablet armchairs might be more appropriate for other types of classrooms. In addition, color that really kind of brings something together will really enhance the feel of a room to really enhance teaching and learning. What I'd also like to highlight is we have renovated a particular space in Webster Hall. If you might be familiar, if you've done a walkabout, Webster 101 was a project that started last summer. Steve Robineau from Zoology uh, approached us with a really passionate plea to build a classroom that would really enhance his teaching of Biology 275. With his zeal and when the planets did align, we ended up building this really terrific room. It's the pictures on the left, the top and the bottom, this classroom um, involves fairly high technology, including an a, a instructional instructor station that allows the instructor to control the, I think it's 60 inch, um, um, computer screens on each table so that the um, screens can display either an individual uh, team or group member's work or can display uh, the work of the instructor, one or any which combination. I don't know if any of you are in that classroom, but it's really an exciting space, not used only by Biology 275 students, but campus-wide. We have instructors that were um, selected to teach in there. It does also involve fairly heavy-duty um, professional development on the part of the instructors. We really need to ensure that the, the faculty members who use the space can use the technology, um, really expand their pedagogical um, tools and techniques to do the best job possible in that space. 
Um, professional development is really a part of all classroom renovation. When we reduce the use of the sta stage on the stage model with a faculty member and a piece of chalk, we really are talking about making teaching more and uh, learning more engaging, more fun uh, in spaces that are really much more um, welcoming and warm and conducive to learning. So Webster 101 is already completed and um, like Steve mentioned, <laughs> it's shocking to have something done really as quickly and amazingly quickly as possible and it's really a terrific space that's used um, by a number of faculty members from women's studies, history, um, zoology, we have sciences, we have humanities, all uh, taking advantage of this terrific space already. In addition, you may have gotten wind, Sakamaki Hall is going to undergo renovation as well for completion targeted for summer, uh, next summer, for fall 2013 uh, launch. Sakamaki, the entire first floor will be general purpose classrooms, but in particular, Wing D is designated as an innovation zone. And the OPDOS, Office of Faculty Development and Academic Support, in conjunction with a lot of input from a variety of constituencies, has developed a small, medium, and large classroom space in Wing D that's going to be absolutely phenomenal. Um, very agile, very different, and there'll be, again, a great deal of assessment and research going on in terms of the pedagogy in these spaces to ensure that um, better learning takes place. So we're very, very excited about this project. That should be launched by next fall. No one approved general purpose classrooms be, uh, across um, Sakamaki Hall, but with, in particular, uh, the Wing D is going to be really terrific space too. So we're very excited about, again, these projects really will make a, a very visible difference to improve the teaching and learning by faculty and students. Um, as Steve alluded to, there's a lot, of, a lot of people involved in the planning, the, the hard work that's done. Uh, so with credit where credit's due, here's some folks that are involved in this, this project. It's a really terrific collaborative effort with the planning office, um, OVCAA folks, as well as, uh, again, funding from uh, Bill Chismar, uh, thanks, and the facilities management folks. So thanks. Thank you. Um, I just want to interrupt just a second to make sure we're not turning this into too much of a monologue. Thank you very much for two great presentations and a lot of really hard work. I do want to point out, uh, and we, we, you know, it may not rise to the level of slides and so on, but we also have a tiger team that's going to go around uh, and do some painting. Uh, which I think is really critical. You know, I, I had a really interesting, uh, we had the Board of Regents meeting over on Maui and I spent some time with Clyde uh, Sakamoto, who's a chancellor over there, and he has one person who is the rust police. And, he, it, it, and it's, I'm thinking, this is a great idea. He walks, they're right by the sea, and so everything gets rusted immediately. And he walks around campus and when he finds rust, they scrape it, they sand it, and they paint it. And so trying to beautify our campus, uh, we're going to do a lot of painting. We're going to do a lot of rust management. And the other thing that I'm really excited about, and this is something my predecessor started, Virginia Hinshaw, was the, the uh, Manoa makeover, where we provide some funding and deans and, and department chairs and so on organize groups that work on beautifying their spaces. And uh, I'm really excited about doing that. If you want a great example of that, I don't know if Larry Paxton's here, but what music has done is really phenomenal. If you go down to the music spaces, you'll see just beautiful room after beautiful room. They own it. I do not go down there and throw your chewing gum on the ground because someone will run up to you and say, how dare you around our beautiful music buildings. So, uh, trying to get that kind of spirit on campus too, and we want to really incentivize that with Manoa makeovers. But so, on facilities, how about some comments, questions, input? Yes. Do we have a portable mic? Aloha, Aloha. Uh, Apple. Thank you for having this gathering again. Um, aloha, I'm just a graduate student in the Department of Education Administration. And my question was actually about um, 
who was consulted or the groups and the reports that are being used to guide the environmental changes on campus. And I noticed that none of the Kuali'i reports or the Native Hawaiian Task Force report that was created um, was listed. And I'm just wondering because I actually sat on that um, committee and we have a whole environment section that talks about how we can include Native Hawaiian, all kinds of things for the environment. And so I'm just curious if that is gonna be part of the implementation process. And, and I will say that the Native Hawaiian uh, Advancement Task Force report is one of the best reports I've ever seen. And we're thinking about how we can incorporate that in all that we're doing. It, it's really a phenomenal report, but uh, Steve, do you want to? Sure, yeah. Well, those reports actually exist at a higher level than the planning office, and they exist in the chancellor's office. So and they're, they're guiding um, the, the chancellor and, and uh, I think the Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs on uh, how to move forward. The, the landscape master plan uh, has been vetted, but it's up for on the, la uh, on the uh, planning office website for further comment. So that's uh, available for anyone who wants to put comments in on that. Um, I think, uh, and I, I'm gonna throw this in, on all of these projects, we look at the idea of um, uh, stewardship and that it is about resource management and setting good examples through values that we have. And that's, uh, I think that's the bottom line that runs as a common thread through all of the, the planning projects that touch on any kind of resource, in, in, including intellectual. Thank you for that comment, and you know we're we're using that task force report at the ground level in very much of what we're doing, whether it's hiring of people, whether it's how we manage our physical infrastructure here, whether it's how we educate and how we incorporate uh, Hawaiian thoughts and culture, and and quite frankly uh, the knowledge that our Native Hawaiians had on how to how to manage the land and be more sustainable things we don't know how to do today. Uh, I'm told that if you go back a couple hundred years and you go to the Big Island, we had something like 400,000 people living on the Big Island and obviously no importing of food, for example. And we can't do that today. So we have a lot to learn from those and we're, we're looking at that report. It's a great report and it's given us a lot of guidance on everything that we do. Hello. Um, I was wondering, in terms of the, the efficient and effective use of teaching space, is it possible that one or at least four or five rooms on campus that the wall spaces can be used? In other words, either whiteboarding the entire wall space so it's not just directed at one uh, talking head professor. It can be divided up and, you know, north, south, east, and west. It facilitates collaborative and United Nations kind of spaces. Yeah, and I think I can, I can probably answer that in a very affirmative yes, and also using some technology so that groups that are working around a table, their results can be immediately posted up to a, to a screen that everyone in the whole room can see. Those kind of technologies that are 360 degrees, and, and those are all in the... It, 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 actually, I, I just saw an example of that as we, as we design our new spaces on the Maui campus, again, where they have these, uh, uh, now what are they called, Steve? The solar, they, they're, they're completely reflective and they're like light pipes and they bring natural light even into the ground floor of a four-story building. And we're looking at all of those and actually incorporating all of that technology into what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but I'm really, in the short term, you're going to see a lot of changes on campus that are going to make this campus a, a better place to learn, a better place to teach, 
a more inviting campus, a more beautiful campus, uh, one that makes us proud, and one that reminds us that we want to do great things every day we come here. Yes, Aaron. Yeah, hi. Um, so we've been talking about the overall uh, looks of the buildings, the painting, this stuff, but we haven't been talking about the overall cleanliness of the buildings. Um, being a student myself, if you go to Spalding, Spalding Lecture Hall 155, I can stare at that same hairball for two months straight, and they aren't, nothing gets cleaned. I don't even know if these carpets are vacuumed, maybe even washed once a semester, but the overall cleanliness of these buildings are just terrible. I mean, yeah, like I said, the same hairball in the building. I don't even know if that's ever cleaned. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we are also uh, very, we, we understand that we have actually uh, underfunded that aspect of the campus. Uh, if you look at the number of people that we had working on maintenance of facilities and janitorial staffs and so on, we've cut back and we have to rethink that. I, I will tell you, and this, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it might even be a controversial statement I'm going to make, but we have a, an incredibly enviable student to faculty ratio compared to most, most universities. And then when you look at the faculty to staff ratio, what you find is that we, we don't have very many staff at all. So we have, we have focused our resources on faculty and not as much on staff. Now, that's a wonderful opportunity for student-faculty interaction. We want to keep that. But we do suffer from not having enough staff. We also, and, and this is going to be a long conversation, we had a, a staff appreciation breakfast couple weeks ago, and I had a wonderful conversation. Uh, a fellow who's a shop steward uh, in bargaining unit one asked me to come over and talk, and he's a, a janitor, and he talked about some of the uh, issues if you're a janitor in a building, and you want, you're proud of your building, you want to maintain it, but there are certain things that you can't do right now, and we have to have these conversations. So. Uh, one fellow talked about how a light was burned out. He reported it, but it hasn't been changed, and it's been months. And he knows how to change it, but can't. Um, another, you know, caulk had, uh, had fallen away from the sink, and water's leaking in. He knows how to do that, but can't. Uh, and then there's issues of plumbing and things where he'd like to be able to do those kinds of things, uh, and would like to get the training and the upgrade of skills. So we want to talk about how people can find ladders to move up and how people can be responsible. One of the things that we're very excited about in making this a nicer campus is the idea of zone management. So I've always known that when people are embedded in a particular group, when you live with a group, you tend to work better with that group, whether it's in getting their grants out or whether it's maintaining their buildings. And the idea is that every building would have someone who lives in the building and walks around the building every day, interacts with the people. You see them at the coffee machine, the Xerox machine. You see them in the hallway. And you're responsible for the building. So when something comes up, there's somebody to go to who has a service mentality and is, is there to make the building work well. And I think that whole, you know, at our next forum, one of the major topics is going to be generally service and how we get to a culture where when there's a problem and it's brought to someone, they own that problem and they're going to, they're going to work that out. Uh, Francisco Hernandez has started some programs already where we have frontline people who are trained so that when there is a problem, they're there to help. And they're not satisfied until the solution to that is found. Sometimes, of course, the answer is how do you say no to someone in a nice way? Uh, because sometimes there is no easy solution. Sometimes you have to say no. But how you do it in a way that gets to some possible yes. And that's, a, that's kind of a bigger conversation, and, and we'll, we'll do that next time. But we need to invest more in people who take care of facilities. You know, I, all I have to do is look up at the ceiling here. And, and see that and realize that, you know, there's an air vent there that, that's a lo really overdue for cleaning and things. And we've got to, you know, we're breathing that and we have to think about how to handle those. Yes. Hi, Chancellor. Hi. I'm sorry if I'm shivering. I'm nervous, but I'm also freezing cold. <laughs> but uh, kind of on that note, um, 
I've been talking about this for a long time, and I know I mentioned it, but I was wondering, because students pay for the electricity here in the end, I'm curious what the campus is gonna do in the short term this year, next year, to reduce electricity costs on top of what we've already done with HVAC. Specifically, the GSO has backed two projects I know of. It's like a lighting retrofit for the whole campus and getting solar vo photovoltaic cells you know, on top of various buildings over the parking lot. Is that moving forward? What's the next step on that? How can students get more involved to keep those electricity costs down to reduce that upward pressure on our tuition? We're, we're working all of those issues, and there's so much momentum behind this. We want to do this so badly because, believe it or not, last year we paid $32 million for power on this campus, which is Unbelievable. Uh, all you have to do, we have 20,000 students. All you got to do is do the division there, and you see this is a huge issue. And we're cold in this building, and I actually, uh, this is a little bit ironic. Uh, someone told me we're saving energy by having it cold because they have to cool the air down to take the humidity out, and then they reheat it. And so when you're freezing cold, we're, quote, saving energy. But we need to get more PV. We need to make sure that, because uh, PV, when you put PV up, it's a one-time expense, but you save money for there on out because, because you, don't have to, you don't have to spend that money. But we need also to figure out, and I'd say learn from our, our native Hawaiian culture on how we live without air conditioning in many cases and, and so on. So, so learning how to, to use the natural benefits that our, that our native Hawaiian culture knew how to do before. And we've got to really work on those. There's a lot of momentum. Whenever anything costs a lot, you get a lot of momentum, which is the good side, is that all of those projects are being worked on and worked on hard. The, uh, Steve and his group have really been trying to push these things. I, you know, it's, it's important for me to say this. Uh, I, as a chancellor, am incredibly committed to making this a sustainable campus. It's going to be one of the things I spend a huge amount of energy on, no pun intended. Uh, this is something I care a lot about. Energy sustainability, food sustainability. We need a better recycling where uh, Steve has talked about water and water usage. Uh, I really want that to be a showcase. And what, what is really great is we have so much energy on campus. We have so many people interested in this. I think naturally being here in Hawaii, everyone's interested in this at a level that you don't see back in the continental US to this level. And uh, we, we really need to be a model and should be a model for every university uh, in the world. And I think we're gonna be there because we have so many people who care about this issue. So we're gonna make some great progress on that and that's a guarantee. Uh, yeah. One of the issues that I'd like to bring up uh, is I noticed that your strategic, you know, master landscape plan, uh, to me, it looked like it was the same space minus parking. Um, and while parking, I mean, we can't really, you know, bring that in as a being sustainable or whatnot. It is an important daily thing for everyone, faculty, staff, students. And currently, the, there's a real squeeze with all the new construction projects, the parking is getting less and less and less available. And I was wondering how do you plan on providing new space? I myself, uh, I ride a scooter to work so I can help save space. Good. But um, the, the lot that I park in, they have actually reduced the scooter parking so that uh, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, there's a problem and they changed it into a loading, they changed this one section of the lot into a loading zone for the enterprise rental car operation that was set up there. And in addition to that, the enterprise rental car operation takes away four stalls uh, in the regular parking lot. Yeah, I, so, I think, are you the fellow that just wrote me? Yeah, yeah, yes, I am. Yeah, I, I, I got your email yesterday, I think, and, uh, and I'm gonna look into that. Uh, but I will say this, and, and again, this isn't gonna win me any popularity, uh, but slowly, I think, I would love to make sure that most of us come in by public transportation, but then have the opportunity once we're here, if we've got to run that noontime errand, we can do it. 
and you're, thank you for riding a scooter. And the fact that we're removing scooter spots is very distressing. And I, I got your email. Uh, I haven't replied to you yet. I apologize. Uh, but I took it in, and, and I do want to see. You're up by Holmes Hall, I believe. And, uh, um, but to me, in this day and age, we should be thinking about how we don't need as much parking, not about how we make more parking and things like that. So uh, I, I take the bus in most days, not all. Uh, and it's wonderful to get in. And uh, I would, you know, when, but then, yeah, when I have to go over to the ledge at noon, how do I get over there? And those kind of things we do with the wee cars. I would love also, you know, some of the things will take time. So it'd be wonderful if people could take bikes, but riding your bike on some of these streets is not healthy. Uh, and so it, I realize all these, those are kind of the longer term. How can we make this area and the campus more bike friendly and Honolulu more bike friendly? Uh, but we do, we are blessed actually with, a, I think, a really fantastic bus system. Uh, it's really good. Of course, it has to ride on the, on the streets that we have. Uh, but but uh, what I hope we can do is find a way to not need as much parking in the long term. Short term, long term, different solutions. Um, and uh, parking is always one of the most volatile issues on a campus. But my, my overarching goal would be to remove the need for parking. Let me, let me give everybody a chance first. Yes. Yes, uh, it's a subset of that topic. And that has to do with the interface between the campus and professional communities, community groups that come on and off. And it seems to me that for decades, it has been very difficult for professionals of you know three or four or five people to say, yeah, let's go have a meeting on campus because they're gonna to have to rotate around the quarry or whatever to find a place, you know, there's no valet little section for meetings or whatever. It's not talking about gouging out large amounts of, uh, of space for permanent parking, but it does have to do with the interface between the community and other professionals and whether or not this is a place where anybody would even consider wanting to have a meeting simply because of the parking. Yeah. Is that part of the planning? Yeah, and, and in fact, I've uh, been having some, some conversations with a lot of folks. Uh, when I met with the Arts and Humanities faculty, in fact, they talked about how parking can be seen as an inhibition to coming to the theater or coming to an orchestra. Uh, and I'd like to make sure that that never happens, that no one feels, oh, I'm not going to go because I won't be able to park. So the idea is, and, and uh, you know, I still have to, my, my financial people, I have to find out, you know, what will this cost and things. But it seems to me that once our staff and faculty have had access to the parking, that maybe at 5 o'clock every day we have free parking, maybe on weekends, complete free parking. I guess we do on one day but not the other on the weekends. Uh, and it should be an open campus. And, and I do see the need to have visitor lots for people who are coming maybe during the day. Uh, and we have a, a, a nice space for them to park. Uh, but again, in general, the, the less demand for parking, the better. But we should have also open, more open access uh, to the campus. I, I want the, quite frankly, I want the welcome mat to be out. I think we at Manoa suffer a little bit and if people don't think we're accessible, they think we're a little bit elitist, a little bit snobby, a little bit uh, looking down. And I'd like us to be an open campus where people feel comfortable coming to campus. They come to campus often. We need a lot more community input. We had a great, a great session uh, maybe a week and a half ago in the evening where we had people uh, came to campus and we had a, a panel discussion. I was fortunate to be on that about the land grant mission. And, people, and, and from that, we realized we need a whole separate meeting on GMOs, and we're going to do that. But having these really weighty issues discussed, that's what a campus is all about. This is a place where anything is on the table. You can talk about any issue, no matter how sensitive, how political, 
this is the kind of place where we do those conversations, where intellectual discussions and discourse happen in a reasoned way, and we have scholars discussing these things. And, and we have to be able, we have to be accessible, so people need to be able to come in and park and not think, oh, you know, I'd love to, oh, there's a talk on GMOs, I'm so passionate about that. Oh, I'm not gonna go, you, you can't park. We'll par have to park a mile away and walk in. I never want that to happen. I, I feel compelled to um, put a spotlight on the elephant in the room, which is these plans are fantastic, but they require money and resources. And my sense from talking to people in my community is that public confidence and the ability of the UH administration to use money wisely is at the lowest it's been in the 20 years that I've been a faculty member here. And so I'm wondering, is it the case that we just ride this out? Or is it the case that there should be some more proactive way that we try to rebuild and restore public confidence in our system? We have to do that. And uh, I'm having a lot of conversations with folks on how to do that. I, it's very important right now that we remind the legislature that the university is our students, our faculty, and our staff not our administration. And so uh, making sure that the legislature realizes the great work that goes on here. We have not had the kind of media coverage of the great things we do, how we change people's lives, how students find their passion here, how we do research and service that completely changes our communities every day. We're doing amazing things on every island from Manoa to really make this a better place and make this state better. And we really need an absolute focus on that this spring so that when the ledge thinks about this university, they don't think about me and Stevie Wonder, but they think about the kinds of things that all of our schools are doing in, ev in every community, embedded in them, making changes, whether it's social work, medicine, law, Everywhere, the, these incredible stories, curing cancer, uh, these are the kind of things that we need to remind the legend. And most of them know this. Most of them love this place. A huge fraction are graduates here. They know how they were transformed here, how they found their passion. And we need to remind them of that and kind of get away from the, the superficial uh, worry. We also have to show them that we do steward our resources well and we have to rebuild that confidence. Absolutely, it's very important. Uh, but I think by being a more open campus, a more transparent campus, and really, really working on trying to rebuild those relationships, we're all gonna be better for. Uh, just a quick comment on color schemes. I hope they'll be practical. Um, in the Scheidler College, we got repainted and that was really wonderful. University requirements call for white floors. Um, they're now half coffee colored, so I hope that can be taken into account. And, and Philip, I kind of disagree. I've been here a long time too, and I don't think the legislature's ever had any uh, good feelings about her ability to handle money. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I can certainly appreciate the work that you have cut out for you to um, do some of the things that you aspire to, especially repairing some of the image problems external to the university. But I haven't been here that long, but it seems like we've got a real problem internally with image. Um, we have a lot, a lot of the people that I've met since I've been here just seem like they've kind of lost hope that things are going to get better and don't know how to make it better. Mm -hmm. And so I've been very impressed by your willingness to open up communication, but it would help me to be able to be a good cheerleader for you if you could tell me, if I look at your top three things that we've talked about last time and this time, um, a lot of them kind of coalesce around the same sorts of areas of operations within the university. And I'd like to know what specifically, like your top three things you're gonna do to make those same systems become functional when they have not been functional for quite some time? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And, and your reaction 
I've seen a hundred times because everyone's like, oh yeah, you're going to make a difference now. We've been living this for decades. <laughs> but, but well, when, when, you, when you came in, you saw that, oh, you can't really change the bureaucracy and so on. I really believe that we can, and there's two ways we can in general. One is having conversations, talking about them, because at, when we talk enough, we realize everybody wants to make these changes. And once that gets in, embedded in the entire culture, I think communication is the real key, is let's talk about these issues. We all realize we want the same things. The other is, in my opinion, is local control, is decentralizing. The further away you get from a problem, the easier it is to put it on a list and make it number 638 to get done. Oh, the light bulb and so on, put it on the list. 638. When it's a local issue, and, and this has to do with travel reimbursements or uh, hiring of people and all that, the more local control there is. So that, it, you know, I sign a lot of things that I add absolutely no value to. I say, you know, the dean can manage this. This is a hire of someone, the dean manages their show, and why am I? involved in this. And sometimes I'm even surprised to see Marcy Greenwood's signature needed. And things are going all the way up the system. And, and I'm really hoping to move those things down. The ones that are system, move them to the Manoa. The things that are at the chancellor's office, move them to the deans. Get things locally controlled. Now that's a big sea change, but it makes a difference. People will work more ardently towards things when they're part of the solution and they're connected to what needs to be done. And that's all about getting things down locally. For, you know, if we had somebody who was in charge of Kuykendall, whose job was to make Kuykendall the most functional building, it would look better than it does now. And that's just the nature of things. Now, yes, we need more people in that area and things like that, and we'll have to find a way to maximize our resources. But those are the two things I'm going to rely on. If I'm wrong about that, I'll, I'll go into the dustbin of another, yet another failed chancellor who couldn't make a difference. But I think communication and local control, along with other good, you know, natural management things, that, that maybe we can we can make a difference. <laughs> I, you know, that's, see, that's the interesting thing. That's part of the, it, that's really the idea behind the Manoa makeover, is that if we let folks, we give them, so we'll, we'll bring the ceiling tiles, you put them in. Now, we're a little afraid about people up on ladders, and, you know, I don't want, I don't want students up on a, up, yeah. But that's exactly the idea. That's local control. Give people the paint and the brush, the pizza, and they paint and they make, go to music and just see what they've done down there. It's stunning. I mean, it's beautiful. And it's because, and, and they have so much pride. And that's, you know, if you can get that local kind of control, I think that's the key. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, thank you for holding this, Chancellor. I actually work as a sprinkler systems repairer here on campus. I've been here about six weeks. Um, I want to say it's been a little frustrating and I've kind of been shocked by some of the uh, state of some of the systems. There's stuff here that's 50 years old, it's, it's rusted. I mean, it's things that like I don't even know how to work on because I haven't ever seen it. It was made before I was born. Um, you know, so obviously this is a problem that's been going on for a while and I, I, I heard Steve talking about the landscape renovations. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff, it seems like it goes out to bid, but you have qualified people on campus that could do some of this stuff. I know we have nursery workers, we have um, people who could probably plant sod. I could actually definitely fix some of the systems, um, but other stuff's gonna have to be redone. But if we send it out to bid and go through the state processes of, um, of you know, soliciting bids and having it awarded and, you know, these years, I mean, how long is this stuff gonna take? Um, McCarthy Mall, I mean, you could put up a picture there of Hawaii Hall, beautiful. I can walk there, it's like an oasis on campus. And I was doing some work over there today. I saw you folks over there after we had the breakfast. Um, go directly to the other side, go to McCarthy Mall. It looks like a desert. It's, it's 
half the stuff is dead. It's um, yeah. not being watered because the sprinklers aren't on timers. They're all manual. We don't have a night water position anymore. I was told that there used to be a position where the guys would actually come and turn those manual sprinklers on at night, provide water to the things, make things grow, make things green, make it look nice. That's not going on anymore. Um, you know, you talked about the, the janitorial stuff. I know there's 18 vacancies of janitors alone. Um, the funding, I mean, just to get parts, the system as far as, as providing work orders. If I see something broken, I can't just go fix it. Yeah. You know, and you just touched on that. I have to send the work order through. It'll bounce around a little bit and come back. And then they say, okay, now well, you're approved to go fix this thing. And that's a little frustrating because I yeah. think that yeah. there are people here on campus that can make a difference. One more thing to the parking. Um, you know, as an employee here, I have to pay for parking. Um, what, I mean, I'm not a tenured professor. I'm not making a lot of money. And I got to come on campus. I actually park off campus and ride a bike in. I can't get a parking stall. And I think that contributes to a little bit of morale issues among some of the people because it's like, gee, we're not making a lot of money here. And then we got to cut, you know, our profit margin is cut because we're paying for parking to get on campus to work for a campus that we want to make better. Yeah. Uh, th those are great points. Uh, and, and boy, those are really good points. Um, <laughs> You mentioned one that, that uh, the, the janitor crew brought up to me, and they said, couldn't we have a, 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 a crew that was a night shift? Because what happens with many of them is they're scrambling around trying to get the campus ready for the onslaught. And actually, some of them end up getting hurt because they're running around like headless chickens trying to get things going. Uh, the, the sprinkler idea, of, of course, you want to actually run the sprinklers before the sun comes up. And, uh, and we need to invest. There are a lot of vacancies. We've already talked, we've already talked to Kathy Cutshaw about that, that we need to invest there. That's kind of the idea. We have a, a great student to faculty ratio, and then we look at the staff, and it's been decimated. The parking, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that. And, and uh, uh, if, uh, I don't want to, Kathy Cutshaw, I hope, isn't carrying a, a gun because uh, she might kill me before I say this, but, but you know, I, it used to really rot. Back when I was an assistant professor making peanuts, I used to think, I can't believe I have to pay to come into work and park. And there's a part of me has always felt that way. And so, but you know, we, we need to look at all those. Uh, you, you brought up a ton of good points. These, the systems that were designed and, and maybe original to the, we, we, you know, and we were talking about renovating classrooms, and we have some desks that still have ink wells in them, and we know we're, we're kind of old. <laughs> so, uh, but we need to work on all of those things, and I promise you some changes. Uh, we're we're going to work on this. We're going to, I won't be able to do everything, but we're going to really make it a, a, a real effort here, because ultimately, the, you know what my overall goal is? Is to raise the expectations of everyone on campus that we can do these things. We start getting a few wins, people start to believe. We start to believe, we'll try harder, and we'll, we'll actually start getting a, a real morale boost And everyone. You know, when you walk on, on uh, campuses that are, you can really, they're really maintained and so on, you feel like, I want to do great things here. And that's what I want for our campus. So thank you, great comments. I think, unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, when's our next, Nish, when's our next one? Do we have it? December 3rd. December 3rd. And, and we'll, actually, we didn't get to all the, uh, Wayne, I'm sorry, uh, we didn't get to campus security, which we've been putting a lot of thought into. Your comments, please keep them coming. I will tell you, they're really, we, we have meetings every week where we talk about these and how we can incorporate them. You're going to make a difference, your comments and your ideas, we hear them and, and they're going to make a difference. Thanks so much, and this, this is a great university, and it's going to be even greater because of your participation. So thank you. <laughs>